Welcome, Minneapolis, and thank you for joining us tonight for the Mayoral Forum on Public Safety. My name is Rachel Joseph, and I'm the founder of Survivors Lead. We're the nation's only gun reform and direct service organization led 100% by survivors. I'm also a gun violence survivor, and all of the Minneapolis voters asking the questions at our forum tonight are trauma survivors as well. We do not regularly host forums, so give us a, a little bit of grace tonight, if you will. Um, I am so grateful for our co-hosts, and I want to tell you briefly about each of them. For over 45 years, Brady has emphasized education, litigation, and legislation to ensure that every community is safe from the daily toll of gun homicide, domestic violence, suicide, unintentional shootings, and police violence. The Community Justice Action Fund is a black and brown led gun violence prevention organization utilizing a threefold strategy that addresses the issue of gun violence in a holistic, sustainable, and intersectional manner. It galvanizes the power of the people most affected by the pain to inform solutions that effectively tackle the root causes of gun violence. A March for Our Lives formed in the days following the tragic shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. March for Our Lives works to harness the power of young people across the country to fight for gun violence prevention policies that save lives. Each of these organizations, as well as Survivors Lead, will be live streaming tonight's event. And I'd encourage folks watching to check out these amazing organizations that have built power nationally and connect with the movement to end the absolutely unacceptable levels of gun violence we're currently seeing in our beloved city of Minneapolis. I'd like to take just a quick moment to pass on some information on ranked choice voting provided by Fair Vote Minnesota. Please reach out to them if you have any questions about ranked choice voting. If you've participated in Minneapolis city elections before, you're probably familiar. Folks in Minneapolis use ranked choice voting to choose our council members, our mayor, members of the park board and more. Under ranked choice voting, you rank candidates in order of preference, first, second, and a third choice, instead of choosing just one. In a single seat race like mayor, if no candidate receives a majority of first place votes, the least popular candidate is defeated and those votes are reassigned to the remaining candidates based on those voters' second choices. This continues until one candidate receives a 50% plus one majority of continuing votes. When Minneapolis began using ranked choice voting in 2009, it eliminated the costly low turnout summer primary. So now voters only have to make one trip to the polls and all the candidates have the opportunity to compete on the November ballot. Rank as many candidates as you like up to three to ensure that if your first choice doesn't make it, your ballot will continue for your second and third choices. So as you listen to the candidates tonight, remember to consider not just your first choice, but your second and third choices as well. If you have any questions, again, about ranked choice voting, please reach out to Fair Vote Minnesota. Before we begin, I'd like to give the candidates running for Minneapolis mayor two minutes each to introduce themselves. We'll start excuse me, alphabetically with AJ Awed and then move to our current mayor, Jacob Fry, Kate Knuth, Sheila Najad, and Jarrell Perry. So AJ, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is AJ Awed. This is a critical time in the history of public safety and for change in Minneapolis. We have begun the difficult journey to redress a history of inequality and injustice in the MPD, but we're also facing an epidemic of crime and the abject failure of our city's leadership. As a war refugee and a young black man, I followed the North Star to Minnesota and earned my Juris Doctorate from Mitchell Hamlin, clerked in the Ramsey County Public Defender's Office. And today I'm a professional mediator specializing in alternative conflict resolutions. Every day, I'm leaning into the working class values handed down to me by my parents. I wanna use these values to create a city where we can all experience dignified public safety. And don't be mistaken, Minneapolis is a world-class city. And that's why it must have world-class public safety. 
I believe a mediator's perspective like mine is exactly what the city needs at this moment. But I wanna be blunt here for a minute because the stakes are just so very high. Minneapolis cannot afford another term for Jacob Fry. He has failed the city. And don't take my word for it. Governor Wall said his public safety leadership was quote, an abject failure last year. Jacob Fry is not the leader the city must have if we are to heal and move forward together. I'm the only person running for mayor who can build the coalition necessary to expand what public safety means and how it's delivered. I will increase public safety funding. I'm the only person who can assemble the people and the coalition necessary to establish and build a foundation for trust, which will be the prerequisite for everyone to feel safe. And I'm the only candidate that can hold the MPD accountable to the people, making certain every peace officer serves us with honor and integrity. I wanna be that mayor, your mayor, the mayor for everyone and every neighborhood. This is our time, Minneapolis, but the messenger the voters sent to lead our city in this election will matter. I wanna be your messenger. So please Thank join you, me and let's Sorry. move this forward together. Thank you. Thank you. And next will be our current mayor, Jacob Fry. Thank you so much to the Brady Campaign, to Survivors Lead, the Community Justice Action Fund, uh, and March for Our Lives for hosting this mayoral forum tonight. So under the first two years of our administration, Minneapolis saw unprecedented progress. And over the last year, we, as a city, have confronted unprecedented challenges together. And to be sure, there is no greater challenge and no greater local point than public safety and criminal justice reform in our city. And we have demanded greater accountability from our police department. Our administration made Minneapolis the first department in Minnesota to impose disciplinary consequences for failure to, failure to comply with our body camera policy. We took a trauma-informed and victim-centered approach when we became the first locality to act on the Attorney General's recommendation for handling sexual assault investigations. And we've taken a very clear-eyed approach when it comes to targeted enforcement for some of the illegal gun trade, which we've seen throughout our city, throughout our state and our nation. Accountability, precision, and compassion are built into our approach and inform the changes we have enacted and those that we want to see enacted moving forward. Is it enough? No, it's not. You won't find a mayor in this entire country who's content with their work on this front. The proliferation of illegal guns have ravaged our city. They've torn apart families and quite frankly, pushed our city to the brink. This is a city problem. This is a state problem. This is a national and a humanitarian problem. So we've invested ourselves and our resources into breaking these cycles and we've got our work cut out for us. But thank you to the advocates, the families, residents and the resilient individuals like all of you who are putting in the work on the ground. And I'm optimistic that we can truly make a change where it's needed most. So thank you so much for your work and thank you for having this forum here today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kate Knuth. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all tonight to talk about the key issue of this campaign and the issue I'm hearing about all around the city when I'm out talking with folks in Minneapolis. I'm Kate Knuth. I'm a mom. I'm a small business owner. I'm a former state representative and I'm an experienced government leader. And I'm running for mayor because I think to meet this moment, this historic moment we're in and make it a real turning point towards economic, racial and environmental justice, we need new leadership. And to get with new leadership uh, and moving towards justice, we can achieve unity in the city of Minneapolis. And I've been out listening mostly since I've started campaigning for mayor. And one thing I have consistently heard is that people are desperate for answers on public safety and they want more than big ideas and rhetoric, they're looking for actual plans and how we are gonna move forward on real solutions that have an impact. I am the only person in this race who has put out a comprehensive public safety plan. I've listened to people's feedback and my and my team, I and my team have connected with uh, dozens of community and policy leaders and put out my building community safety and transforming policing plan. And the core value at the center of this plan is pretty simple. It is that every person in Minneapolis, regardless of race, regardless of gender, age, ability, 
zip code income deserves to feel and be safe in our city. And we are at a defining moment in the city. And honestly, it is uncomfortable. These kinds of transformative moments really are. But I, I believe that if we all dig in, we can make Minneapolis in a, to a place that truly works for everyone and is truly safe for everyone. And we can be a place that is in the headlines for all the right reasons. And those right reasons come from us stepping forward with courage, possibility, and respect for each other. Look forward to the conversation today. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, next, we'll hear from Sheila Najad. Hi, everyone watching on Facebook land. My name is Sheila Najad, and my campaign is called Sheila for the People. I have been doing public policy and community organizing work for over a decade in Minneapolis. Last summer, I stood with the community on the ground through mutual aid and as an organizer. In my work, I've trained hundreds of people on how to get involved in the city budget process and pushed the city to reinvest a historic 8 million from the police budget into mental health and violence prevention. My motto is from the streets to the spreadsheets because I believe the best solutions come from people who are leading change on the ground. Everyone deserves to live free from violence and to be cared for when harm happens. In 2012, I became a trained sexual assault advocate. I wasn't yet a survivor, but I knew the importance of having more people like me, queer people, people of color, children of immigrants, available to support people experiencing harm. It was in that training where I became committed to creating conditions of self-determination for oppressed peoples and reclaiming our power from those who have harmed us. And that's what steers me as a candidate, giving power to the people and self-determination. People are experts in their own lived experiences and we can change our city government to put resources behind those solutions. That's why I wanna put $10 million into participatory budgeting so residents can have a meaningful say in how the city's money is spent. My campaign is called Sheila for the People because I want a mayor who is for the people. And after this forum, I would love to connect with you. Please reach out to me. I want to build our solutions together. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Gerald Perry. All right, hello. Thank you to everyone that played a role in this opportunity to share with you all today. Um, we know there are a lot of faces out front, names we may be all familiar with, but I also want to send a special thank you to all those who have been and continue to work behind the scenes. Uh, without you, this would not be able to be a success. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as far as our campaign, period for the people of Minneapolis, um, as a city, we are at our most pivotal point in our over 171 year history. We are confronting a moment that demands our attention and our acknowledgement, not just with our words, but in action. Together, we are committed to pursuing a city united through love and reconciliation. Whether it is our need for racial reconciliation, housing reconciliation, education reconciliation, job reconciliation, business ownership reconciliation, youth and young adult outreach reconciliation, public safety reconciliation or climate reconciliation. We all know what the needs are, so there's no need in going into details at this point but we all know what the needs are present and we know that the needs are very, very, very real. Our current mayor has said that he has tried and done his best. I believe him. Unfortunately, this time calls for something much bigger, much bolder and much more courageous. Our current mayor, Mr. Fry said himself recently that he has been trying to figure this out for the last three years regarding public safety. Well, we have a message for him. The messages for the people of Minneapolis cannot wait another three years for us to try to figure this out. The people of Minneapolis cannot wait idly by risking our safety, our freedom, losing our lives, nor compromising the health or the lives of our children. We cannot sit back and continue to plan or propose or recommend change. We the people of Minneapolis cannot wait and we the people of Minneapolis will not wait. I may not have the longest pedigree or the be the most traditionally qualified candidate. That's your time, Gerald. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Okay, no problem. Um, I'll, I'll get, I'm, I'm my next opportunity. <laughs> okay, great. 
Well, thank you all for running and for participating in tonight's mayoral forum on public safety. Um, let's hear our first question, which will be from Mark Jonigan. He's a gun violence survivor and the founder and CEO of the Twin Cities Recovery Project Incorporated. Mark serves on the boards of and works with community partners at Hazelden, the Betty Ford Foundation Advisory Council for the Opioid Epidemic in the African American Community, the Minnesota Med Medication Assisted Treatment Prescription Drug and Opioid Addiction T, and is an advisor to the Surgeon General on the National Opioid Epidemic. Mark has presented to audiences at the White House, Metro State University and the University of Minnesota, Harvard University and more. Welcome, Mark, let's hear your question. Oh, Mark, I think you're muted. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was. Thank you, Rachel, for having me, um, giving me this great opportunity and congratulations to to all those who are, are running for mayor. Good to see you again, Mayor Fryer. Mayor, mayor Fry, um, we had a good time on Juneteenth. My, my question to, to, to you all is, um, opioid deaths are on the rise and have killed more than 3,500 Minnesotans in the last 15 years. How will you address the sharp rise in opioid use and deaths here in Minneapolis, especially amongst those of color, communities of color. Thank you. And answers will start with Mayor Jacob Fry. Thank you, Mark. And, and good to see you again just a few days later here. And I'll, look, no corner of our city has been spared from this opioid crisis. This is a, a scourge uh, responsible before COVID for reversing this decades long trend of increasing life expectancy throughout the country and the toll that let's be clear, the pharmaceutical manufacturers have exacted on our cities is frankly criminal. Uh, and let's be very honest, this is corporate America and specifically the pharmaceutical companies that have been knowingly rigging the system to enrich themselves at the expense of so many of our neighbors. And we have uh, taken a compassionate approach to this public health epidemic, and we've treated it as a public health epidemic by investing in the lock zone for every single one of our emergency responders, the first time that we've done that in our city's history. We worked with our health department to pile, pilot new work and advance culturally specific programs to meet people where they are with organizations who have earned trust. We've added wraparound services and support to those who are struggling with addiction. And we've added needle and syringe drop boxes just to ensure uh, safety and health throughout our diverse communities. Additionally, our first, our very first first step program is designed to break cycles of addiction by ensuring that the people suffering from an overdose have this immediate assistance and access from their hospital bed to the services that they need from trusted partners. We've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in community partnerships specifically to serve East African and native youth and collected syringe litter as well. And this is just an example of the work that is already underway that we need to continue. These are programs that we started. These are tangible dollars in community partnerships specifically to serve in collaboration with community. That's the specifics that you wanna see, not rhetoric not calling about waving a magic wand, but this is the specific work that is underway. So we need to focus our work on some of the, the, on harm reduction, which we've seen throughout. We need to continue recognizing the reality that we cannot arrest our way out of this crisis. There needs to be a compassionate approach and that's the approach that we're pushing for. Thank you. Uh, next is Kate Knuth. Well, thank you for this question. Um, it is something I've heard a lot about in the campaign and like way too many people in our community and across the state, I, I too have had a family member who has struggled with opioid use. And my approach to this uh, issue is meeting people who've struggled with substance use with a kind of compassion and empathy and actual effective solutions to help them move through the challenges they face and move forward in healthy ways. And, and I think that's a, this is a human problem for so many people in our community. And I think we really need to center that in our approach. 
And too many communities haven't been getting the adequate support that they need. And when I talk about a holistic approach, um, it really centers people's health and well-being and the needs to meet them where they are. And that means treating opioids, opioid use and substance abuse as the public health crisis that it is and stepping forward with the many tools that a public health crisis can be dealt with. I, I have heard from leaders in the indigenous community, leaders in the East African community, that they are hungry for culturally competent services and responses um, to make sure people are being met um, with the kind of resources and help they need. I want to make sure we are coordinating and connecting harm reduction services, safe needle disposal sites, clean syringe exchanges, so we aren't piling on top um, HIV or uh, uh, hepatitis outbreaks because people are using unsafe needles. And we wanna have more folks carrying naloxone in our community and also trainings on opioid antagonists to make sure people's crisis doesn't turn into a death sentence. And we need to be responding to things like encampments, knowing that an opioid crisis is going on and as camp encampments are broken, break, broken up, if that happens, um, making sure people don't increase um, substance or opioid use and result in more overdose, overdoses and potentially deaths. So my overall holistic approach to public safety centers the needs of people and evidence-based responses to those needs. And that's exactly how I will take on um, the increase in opioid use and challenges that Thank surround you. it. Thank you, Kate. Um, next is Sheila Najat. Thank you for this question. So I remember standing in front of city council after the mayor's proposed budget in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, asking for solutions to the opioid crisis. There was a group called the Opioid Task Force that came up with a long list of recommendations, very few of which were implemented. And that's kind of um, unfortunately often the case in city government work is we just do a task force, but we don't implement the changes. So my first priority as a candidate, as mayor is put your money where your mouth is. We need real resources and real solutions. No one is disposable and no one should die because they use drugs. And to get there, we have a clear path forward that we need funding for. So this past fall, I was part of a group that wrote the people's budget and we worked with um, several street outreach groups outside harm reduction, the sex workers outreach project, uh, other folks in community to say, okay, what can we start right now? We know this is a big problem, but what can we do today? And these are the solutions we put before the council, none of which were funded, unfortunately. We said, fund a pilot study for safe consumption sites. Fund the development of a minimum of two culturally specific community-based drop-in centers with a focus on harm reduction, one in North and one in South. Fund grassroots harm reduction groups like Southside Harm Reduction and SWAP. Farm, fund harm reduction supplies. Fund a vehicle and mobile support so that people can get connected to services, not just hear about them, right? And fund the development and delivery of public health education about safer drug use, safer sexual health, infectious diseases and connecting to low barrier, culturally specific community resources. This education must be destigmatized, evidence-based, harm reduction-based, and developed by people with lived experience in partnership with existing grassroots harm reduction programs. So that's my, that's my commitment to you as a candidate. And if mayor, I'm gonna Thank follow- Thank you, these. Sheila. Thank you. I gotta start my timer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next up is Jarrell Perry. Thank you. Well, opioid related deaths in the state of Minnesota are up 59% from 2019 to 2020. Went from 412 deaths to 654. And that's just the recorded deaths that we know from things like synthetic drugs like fentanyl, uh, which alone rose 82%. Um, we know that it's not just drugs that are off the streets. We have doctors that are also writing scripts. So it's not just the tops at the pharmaceutical companies. Um, data shows that out of every 100 prescriptions written, 35 of them are for opioids. 
going to residents of Minnesota. And that's producing neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. 15 out of 1,000 of our babies born are born with this syndrome. And the state's spending about $530 million annually on that. Just imagine if that money was spent going towards pre prevention. Um, it's one thing to say we understand what people are going through or what people are faced with, but it's a whole other thing to know that through lived experience. And addiction is something that I've dealt with. Um, we can do things like community outreach, Rule 25s, um, faith-based organizations. They provide these services so we can get people access to that. And then even the encampments, getting people off the streets and into housing, using housing first with wraparound services so that they can have access to preventive care, so they can have access to getting away from the addiction cycle. A lot of it's generational as well. So if we can put things in place to help support people genuinely and not just criminalize them for doing what they're doing, I think that could make a very big difference. Thank you so much. Um, and the last person to answer this question would be AJ Awet. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, this is a very important issue um, and we really have to be honest with ourselves when we're discussing it. Uh, Perry's answer really pretty much strikes the code of what I'm really thinking about, which is not that it's just about pharmaceuticals, but the reality is that a lot of these kids that are dying off the streets is synthetic drugs. And that's because people are starting to get and adopt this culture of drug selling, which is really toxic and dangerous. Uh, you cannot you know, order things offline in the deep web or the dark web and start to sell that on the streets. But more importantly, we gotta think about how we're really handling these issues. Uh, who are these organizations that the CDS partner up with? Because as I'm on the campaign trail, many of the things that I'm hearing over and over again is that the right people aren't getting empowered. The right organizations aren't getting empowered and the right credible partners aren't the ones on the ground. So if we're gonna have real leadership and if we're gonna be able to have individuals that are serious about this issue, it's time to overhaul who we're doing business with. Because if it's not reflecting on the ground, that's because we're not having the right people in, in, in power. Um, so for me, what I intend to do when it comes to these issues is obviously explore culturally specific programs. As an East African myself, I understand the need for that and understanding that one solution isn't the only solution. Um, but we also have to look at ways that we can incorporate how we empower family units. Um, many of the things that deals with drugs and when we're talking about the life expectancies of individuals uh, is really deeply rooted into family breakdown. And as Americans and as the city, I think we have gotten far from family values and in understanding that we really need to invest in families, not just individuals, not just individuals struggling with drugs, not individuals that are marginalized or disenfranchised, but also looking at the collective unit of the diversity of the city. So I plan on having that perspective to answer this issue. And I'm looking forward, honestly, to the right partners and people that have the lived experiences that actually can guide and give guidance in these moments. So that's, that's what I plan on doing. Thank you, AJ. Um, thank you all. Next, I would like you to meet Sarah Spafford Freeman. Sarah is a community organizer, a strategy consultant, a mother of three dragons, some of my favorite dragons, um, and a survivor of violence as well. Sarah is on the board of directors of the Advancing Equity Coalition and is a former board member and chair for the Domestic Abuse Project where she still volunteers. Sarah leads finance clubs at two Minneapolis public schools, wrote and presented Apartheid in Minneapolis, an examination of racial disparities and local systems of housing, health, Wealth, Public Schools, and Public Safety, and co-founded the Minneapolis Public Schools Academics Advocacy Group. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you so much for all the work uh, you and the organizers did to put this event together and to the candidates for taking our questions. Uh, during the pandemic, request for emergency services at the intersection of domestic violence and gun violence skyrocketed. I'm wondering if the candidates can speak to how the city of Minneapolis can expand access to critical services for those experiencing violence in their homes. 
and the answers will start with Kate Knuth. Well, thank you so much for this question. And I wanna really thank you for the context of the question as, as well. I think it's really important to acknowledge the context of the pandemic as a driver of one of the drivers of increase in violence that we have seen in our city, as well as the skyrocketing gun sales that we have seen, not just in our city, but in our state and country overall. And I think to get the right answers, we need to make sure that we are looking at the problems um, with real and honest answers. And we have seen too many, including our mayor, try to connect calls to defund the police with increases in violence. And there's just frankly no evidence for that. Um, but to get specifically to the question uh, for domestic violence, I think it's really important to center the experience of victim survivors. And we need to get this right, both because of the people impacted directly by domestic violence in their homes, and because we know it's a huge contributor to increases in community violence over time. So it's both really important for survivors and really important for our community overall. In my comprehensive plan, I propose creating a division of domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence and abuse prevention as part of a larger Department of Public Safety. And I wanna make sure we are coordinating with county and local nonprofits to provide immediate access to mental health services when someone experiences violence in their home. We wanna make sure we are helping people um, with uh, re filing complaints, with filing restraining orders. Our system is not always meeting people with the kind of help they need they need and we need to make sure our system is not re-traumatizing people who have already experienced violence and need help dealing with uh, the outcomes of it. Finally, we need to make sure we're funding community organizations like Survivors Lead to help partner in this work. The city government is not always the best face in helping with survivors navigate what they need to be going through and we need community partners who are trusted and effective in this work, both to inform our policy and to help deliver it in ways that keep people in our community um, safe and restore feelings of, of safety and well-being in their, in their homes and in community more broadly. Thank you, Kate. Um, next up is Sheila Najad. Thank you. So I live in the central neighborhood and over the past year, I have definitely heard an increase in gun violence in my neighborhood. And in the last year, I've also had an unprecedented amount of calls from friends and acquaintances asking for resources to get connected for loved ones who are experiencing harm in their home. And most of my friends, don't call the police because we know that they probably won't believe us. And even if they do, they probably won't help. Everyone deserves to live free from violence and any solution should center the people who have experienced that violence. We know that domestic violence and community violence are interconnected and those who commit the most violent um, offenses in the community often experienced or saw violence in their homes as a child. So we've been asking for it for years. We need to expand proactive ser services that end cycles of violence. When I'm mayor, I will work with survivors to craft solutions that are comprehensive from childhood to adulthood. One of the things I'd like to fight for is instituting comprehensive sex ed in all our schools that includes detailed information on consent, healthy relationships, and conflict resolution. I will also fight for funding for survivor design support systems and more funding for perpetrator re rehabilitation programs that show promise. The pandemic laid bare how poverty and lack of affordable housing keeps people trapped in dangerous situations. As mayor, I will fight for more safety, and that means better jobs, affordable housing, child care, everything folks need to live safe, dignified lives. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, next up is Jarrell, Jarrell Perry. Thank you for the question. Um, we all know that we're facing COVID-19, still facing COVID-19 as a pandemic. But in the city of Minneapolis, racism has also been declared a public health emergency. And then we're still dealing with the fallout from the civil unrest surrounding the murder of Mr. George Perry Floyd. Um, there's a lot of different stressors that are going on, the lack of resources, uh, job loss, 
evictions or the threat of evictions if you're not already homeless. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are needed, but I believe the funding is the most important thing to fund community organizations, to fund community resources, um, to make sure that people's general needs are taken care of. And I think that'll remove a lot of that. And um, just like the last topic, understanding what somebody's telling you is one thing, but knowing firsthand is different. I dealt with domestic violence even recently um, and called Minneapolis Police Department for a mental health situation that we are advocating to have a different department take care of. But as a black man, I was not only not believed, but I was arrested. And it took a judge to look at it and dismiss it, a letter from the BCA to support expungement, a letter from the county attorney, city attorney to support expungement. Like people have to go through a lot of different hoops and hurdles to get justice in regards to these situations. And we have to make that process a lot easier, streamline that so that people, number one, are willing to report. And then number two, when they do go the extra mile to do that, that they're taken care of and not treated like they did something wrong. A lot of people in these situations can't help that they're in these situations and they wanna do any and everything they can do to get out of them. And it's our job as leadership to help them do just that. Great, thank you. Uh, next up is AJ Oed. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, very important question. Um, and honestly, from my experience as a mediator, uh, alternative conflict resolution is really the way to go about this and really getting uh, expanding how we use it and thinking about restorative justice in the terms of domestic violence. Um, when we're talking about how we're going to go about it, it's really going to come to being neighborhood centric and community centric. Um, culturally specific programs is halfway up the step, but people need to understand the city of Minneapolis is not in the 90s anymore. It is a very, very fast growing and diverse city. Uh, and when we think about how our neighborhoods are organized, we have to be honest with ourselves there too. We are self-regulated, which could be a bad thing. It could be a good thing. But for me, what I see in that is that every neighborhood has a specific spirit to it, and they all have different needs. Uh, the leadership that I would bring to Minneapolis as mayor would be really to empower these organizations. I'm the executive director currently at a neighborhood association. I've seen the last year how they really helped the state and the city deal with COVID and how they rapidly brought up community clinics. This is the type of empowerment that true leadership really leans on. And for me, my perspective is that's the audience that I really wanna do work with because ultimately they'll be able to help us navigate. Um, now, I know funding is, is the thing that everybody's gonna be talking about. And honestly, it's very, very important. Uh, but if we don't you know, connect this funding and new revenue streams with empowering the neighborhoods and getting away from a centralized format where it's really just the city telling what to do to everybody, we're not gonna really get the impact that we're looking for. So for me, it's really looking at how we get this funding again to the right partners and also those right neighborhood associations that are doing the work and that, that we could really lean on when we're talking about how we're gonna deal with these issues. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Mayor Jacob Fry. Thank you. So just about every suggestion made thus far by the other candidates in answers is either already underway or it has been completed and we are thinking bigger. Uh, our first and overriding focus must be on the victim in these situations. It's very early in my administration, we did in fact push for policies that govern our, se our sexual assault and domestic violence investigations that are victim centered, that are trauma informed. And we do have a specific entity that is focused on it. We installed victim advocates with the office and in the department, and we placed money into partnerships like the Minnesota Day One Crisis Hotline. Uh, beyond the focus on victims, we also must look at the underlying causes and some of the accelerants of these situations. Uh, we know that violence, domestic or otherwise, can turn especially deadly when the perpetrator has access in some way, shape, or form to a firearm. Let's be honest, the status and the ease and the availability of guns in the United States is ridiculous. We have more guns than we have people in this country. The gun ownership in the United States is twice that of any other nation in the world, the next highest being Yemen. 
We also must focus on what we can do at the state legislatures and in city government. And of course, I support gun reform to prevent firearms from getting in the hands of offenders, including domestic. I support initiatives in states across the country the surrounding uh, red flag laws and preventing illegal guns from entering the city by the trunk load. Uh, we can and we must double down on the work to interrupt these cycles of violence. And that's what we're doing through the American Rescue Plan proposal by expanding our group violence intervention initiative investing in our violence interrupters model and freeing up new funding for alternative community safety strategies. These aren't just new ideas that are being proposed by individuals running for the office of mayor. These are ideas that are already happening, that are already underway. Thank you, Mayor Fry, and thank you all for those answers. Um, next, I'd like you to meet Farhia Budul. Farhia is a certified peer recovery specialist, a certified prevention professional who's widely recognized as a leader with regard to substance use disorders, recovery advocacy, and service delivery. Farhia, a person with lived experience of substance use disorder and recovery, is a fierce voice for the unmet recovery needs of Minnesota's BIPOC communities. She is the founder and executive director of NIA Recovery Initiative, the first recovery community organization in the nation to assist the East African Muslim community by raising awareness and education, pretreatment initiation, intervention, and helping clients sustain recovery after treatment. Farhia is a passionate, excuse me, Farhia is a passionate advocate for recovery and bridging the gap to long-term recovery. Welcome, Farhia. Thank you so much, Survivors Led, Rachel, and all the partners. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to be part of this forum. Congratulations to all the candidates. Uh, my question, in addition to a shortage of shelter beds, there's a gap between the income of people experiencing homelessness and the affordability, availability, and safety of rental units. How will you address this problem to make sure everyone in Minnesota has access to safe and affordable housing? And we will start with Sheila Najad. All right, thank you so much. So I've been a lifelong renter in Minneapolis and I currently rent in the central neighborhood. I was also a restaurant worker for 10 years and I know what it's like to work doubles for an entire week and still be barely able to make the rent in Minneapolis. We need to develop a new approach to housing across the city that sets people up to succeed and stay in safe, dignified housing. To get there, we I support a housing first policy, expansion of public housing, rent control, tenant opportunity to purchase, and redefining what we call affordable housing. So when we look around at new development in Minneapolis, I think of my neighborhood. So I live not too far from Powderhorn Park where last summer hundreds of people stayed in an encampment. You walk down just a few blocks there's the Sophie apartment building where studio apartments are going for $1,500 a month. To me, that's a moral failure of our city and we can and should do better. The other thing that I would like to invest in as mayor is harm reduction. So making sure that if people are moving into shelter, into transitional and permanent housing, that they're being set up to succeed. Right. So this past summer, I did some encampment support and the county opened these emergency shelter hotels, but they were completely sober spaces. So if someone got placed in those hotels and wasn't able to go cold turkey, they got kicked right back out. That's not meeting people with dignity. That's not setting people up for success. And as mayor, I would invest in harm reduction solutions that help people get and stay in housing as well as more public jobs and better paying jobs throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Next is Jarrell Perry. All right, thank you for the question. Um, as far as shortage of beds at the shelters, there were also shortage of beds at hospitals during 
the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we made makeshift shelters. The Target Center is currently in limbo and could be used. Um, like Ms. Sheila was just talking about, the Housing First Initiative could get people off the streets immediately and provide wraparound services to, to also assist with other resources that they need, including addiction counseling. Um, hotel owners have struggled so we could help those business owners fill their vacant rooms through housing vouchers and also affordable housing. We've been touting our affordable housing in the city of Minneapolis. And like Ms. Sheila said, again, there's units going for 15, 16, 17, 18, 1900 dollars a month. And it's classified as affordable housing. Who is that affordable to? It's not affordable to people of Minneapolis. So we have to have affordable housing that is income based, that is individualized going on individual income, no more than 30% of your income. We need to get rid of background checks that go through anything outside of your rental history, credit checks that, that deal with anything outside of your rental history should not be included in finding an affordable home. There are many things that we can do. There are things that have been done like stable homes, stable schools. That's awesome, but it only serves 18 of our 100 Minneapolis public schools. And as mayor, I plan to expand that to include all 100 schools and include every student and family that is in need of housing. It's something that we can do, and it's something that we must do. There's funding for it already, and there's a whole bunch more money coming that can more than pay for this. It's not going to cost the taxpayers of Minneapolis not another dollar. Again, we can do it. We must do it. Sorry, next up is AJ. I apologize, I was muted. No, you're fine. Thank you for that question. Um, so housing is, is a dear issue to me personally. Um, as an immigrant to this country, we went straight to public housing. We really couldn't survive on the market. Um, and it's really quite outrageous to see the trend in, in urban housing and housing period in this city and throughout the country. Um, now, a lot of other candidates have brought up really good ideas that I'm fully in support of. Uh, Merck and rent control is one of them. Um, the tenant opportunity to purchase is another. Um, but I think we need to go a little bit further. Uh, honestly, when we're talking about this issue, we need to be honest with ourselves. And that means luxury apartments are not going to stop growing in this city. They will. Now, the question is, how do we deal with it as a city? And as we grow, how do we maintain and manage it? The way I propose on doing that is through a luxury tax. It's a homeless tax would allow us to actually have funding in the city to go ahead and to go into public and private partnerships where we can actually stimulate housing and affordable housing. Uh, the issue when we're talking about housing as many op uh, uh, opponents to rent control say is that it's gonna, it's gonna stagnate the market and it won't lead to development. Well, if that's the case, AJ is telling you, I wanna tax the people that can afford it. Um, we need to get back to that type of framework. It's really sad to see a progressive and democratic city like Minneapolis really not leading in stuff like this. And by the way, this comes from Arizona. Uh, this comes from a Republican county. And if they're doing it down there, I think we should be definitely doing it up here. Uh, and what that means is when we're talking about homelessness and this creative way of doing it, the city is pressed for budget money. It is. That's in failed leadership that put us in this predicament. But what we need to do now is talk to each other and say, how are we going to go into the pockets of our own and bring more money out so we can honestly answer these issues? And I don't think many of our wealthy, well-off neighbors in Minneapolis are going to be upset that there's a $20 rental tax on their rental units. I think if they want to explore and live in the city and have these beautiful parks and you know uh, 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 experience the city of the lakes in the way that it should be, uh, then they should be partaking in that way of getting people out of encampments and into homes. Because AJ. I promise under my leadership, houses are a priority. Thank you, AJ. Next up, we'll hear from Mayor Jacob Fry. Thank you. So affordable housing is my passion. Uh, housing is literally the reason that I pursued public office to begin with. That conviction has been something that we as a city have been living out in policy. I'm a believer that housing is a right. Housing is a right. I said that at my inauguration speech 
and we have invested more on a per capita basis than almost any city in the entire country in affordable housing with a focus on deeply affordable housing. Everyone should have that safe place where they can go home to at the end of the night to rest their head on the pillow and to rejuvenate for the next day. And as we know, not everyone has that right as we speak. We have a community that's experiencing homelessness and unsheltered homelessness. We have people experiencing homelessness who are working, but they can't make up the gap between the cost of a shelter and the cost of the deepest affordable housing that we have had in our city. And because of that, we collectively are perpetually keeping them as homeless. And not only is, is that a, a bad or a moral decision, uh, it's, it's also a financially really dumb decision as well, because it costs several times more to keep someone on the street cycling through poverty, poverty and hospital stays and, 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 and sometimes even jail than it does to provide them with that home. And here's what we've done. We have invested more than ever before, in fact, several times more than ever before in deeply affordable housing with a focus on 30% of area median income and even below with a focus on low or no barrier housing where we do put that housing first model right at the forefront, making sure that people have a foundation from which they can rise, making sure that they have the tools so that they can succeed. Have we invested in shelters? Yes, we've put in several with a new model that provides people with the dignity and compassion that they deserve. Have we provided new models around homes? Yes, we have. Stable Homes, Stable Schools is an excellent model, already served almost 3,000 kids, 90% of whom are BIPOC. And to Mr. Jarrell Perry's point, to the extent we can bring it to the rest of the city, the answer is absolutely, and I would love to partner with you in doing that. Um, to Ms. Kwan, who wants to make sure that we're getting additional taxes from the legislature that we're able to use, I'm for that too. We need to work together. We need to be specific because people demand that kind of honesty. Thank you. Next up is Kate Knuth. Well, I really appreciate you asking this question about housing as part of a public safety forum because housing and basic economic security is the foundation of public safety. And if you look at my public safety plan, you will see it starts with housing. And when I think about the approach we need to take to housing, there's two basic things that underlie that. First, we are in a housing crisis. It is after public safety, the thing I probably hear most about. Second, everyone deserves a safe place to live and feel secure in at the end of the day. And so my approach to housing is multifaceted. It's the way you'd approach a crisis of something that is fundamentally important to dealing with everyone's daily lives and public safety. Um, so I do support increased investments in affordable housing. I support investing in more housing overall. I also think we need to be more fully investing in public housing, which is affordable housing that is actually connected to people's income. And we have a way to do that with a public housing levy that will help us keep our public housing we have in good condition and add more. In addition to investing in more housing and different kinds of housing that work for people in different ways, we need to make sure we're protecting renters. We are a city of renters. Half of the people in Minneapolis rent and half of our renters are currently cost burdened, meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income in housing costs per month. I support passing rent stabilization, well-designed, because well-designed rent stabilization, even better, it helps people at the, the lower cost of housing side of the spectrum even more, and that's where we need to focus many of our renter protection efforts. I support tenant opportunity to purchase, and I support making sure people have the support and help they need in case they are facing eviction, in terms of getting access to counsel, in terms of getting help if they are facing the deep, deep crisis of being evicted from their home and from their housing. So I'm, I'm excited that we do have multiple different ways to approach this issue and I am ready as mayor to use every single one of them to make sure not just some people can live in Minneapolis, but people of different incomes and backgrounds and experience and origin can call this city their home and have a safe, secure place to live. Thank you, Kate. Thanks to each of you for your answers. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Heidi Brennigan. Heidi has lived in Minneapolis for over 20 years. She is the Chief Marketing Officer at the Animal Emergency and Referral Center of Minnesota and a survivor of gun violence. Welcome, Heidi. 
Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you to all the candidates for giving me the opportunity to um, ask you a question this evening. Please indulge me for a moment as I provide some background for my question. Uh, like probably a lot of Minneapolitans, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I always learn something new from them. Um, did you know that prior to 1970, the job of paramedics didn't even exist? Police officers were expected to respond to emergency medical calls and transport people to hospitals. And in fact, in 1965, a study was conducted that evaluated pre-hospital emergency care. The report identified that, quote, if seriously wounded, chances of survival would be better in a zone of combat than on the average city street. There are without question lots of jobs that today's police officers are required to do every day that either another position already in existence would be better suited to, or a new position still yet to be discovered would be ideal for. And that leads to my question for you tonight. Are you in favor of the public safety charter amendment and creating a city public, uh, department of public safety? Why or why not? And what does your plan to improve public safety look like? Thanks, Heidi. And our answers will start with Gerald Perry. All right, thank you for the question, Ms. Heidi. Uh, a while ago, the fire department, they used to respond to calls to get a cat out of the tree. And uh, some person came up with a brilliant idea to start having the Animal Humane Society come and do stuff like that. So it's not about taking stuff away, it's about making the job easier. Um, I am definitely for the Charter Amendment creating a Department of Public Safety. Uh, we currently have 888 officers, that's the mandate for Minneapolis. Uh, data shows only 10% of them live in the city. So that's over 800 officers that are taking about $60 million of Minneapolis taxpayer money to other cities in which they live, boosting their city's economy, giving their city resources, their children and youth activities of over $60 million. And that only accounts for the actual officers. It does not include none of the police department staff uh, that work around our five precincts. It does not include the millions of dollars in overtime that Mayor Fry has authorized, nor does it include the millions more he has requested be slated for law enforcement while he has also authorized and been taken away from youth programming like the Step Up program. There are many things that we do, public safety encompasses a lot, including housing, including mental health services. Public safety is very, very important to so many residents and everybody has ideas as into what it's gonna take to fully provide public safety. Um, but we're not going to know what works until we actually try something. Again, we can propose, we can plan, we can recommend all we want to. But until we put something in action to actually show the residents that not only do we know what your concern is, we acknowledge it. And it's just important to us as it is to you. And we're going to do something about that. Again, we will not know what works until we step out on faith and try something. Thank you for that answer, Jarrell. Um, next up is AJ Owet. Thank you very much. Um, this is overwhelmingly the biggest issue facing the city. Um, and when it comes to this charter amendment, before I really answer the question, the question I really have in my head is, how do we eradicate racism, white supremacy in the system? And how do we bring back and build trust in it inherently? I do not believe that any initiative done through a process where it's just a small group and there isn't wider participation in a formal, legitimate way of getting the community involved in actually setting up the amendment is going to survive or actually be sustainable. So what do I have in mind? I believe that we need to have a citizen assembly in this city. And if you don't know what that is, that means we take a representative body throughout the whole city because of its diversity. And we make sure BIPOC community members have a real stake in drafting and looking forward to what the new model of public safety will look like. No offense, but this amendment has been funded by George Soros with $500,000 deposit. That's one individual with his own interests. And if trust is going to be repaired, this means simply black, brown, and BIPOC communities at large need to legitimize it. And that's why a formal process is better than an informal one. So without taking that formal step, I could not possibly support this amendment. And that's because it's not going to last long. 
and it's not gonna be sustainable. And it's not gonna allow me to teach my son to trust law enforcement. I had a voter tell me that the experience that she had growing up and the things that her parents taught her was to run to police officers because they are the safe people. They're the safe guys. Unfortunately, black and brown communities don't raise our kids that way. And that's what needs to be fixed. Let's not play politics with this issue, ladies and gentlemen, because if we continue to do that 10, 20, 30 years later, we will be calling an issue of racism and white supremacy because the people, Thank you, AJ. The people did not participate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Mayor Fry. Thank you. So as to the question of the Department of Public Safety, yes. We've been moving full speed ahead towards a comprehensive and coordinated approach that breaks down these silos for years now. And yes, it is time we, we formalize it. We all believe, every one of us, that not every response to a 911 call requires an officer with a gun. We all believe that violence prevention and intervention must be paramount and new strategies on this forefront deserve all, our full support. Uh, and it's not enough to be responsive. We need to be proactive and break these cycles of violence or stop them before they even begin. We all believe that the status quo is unacceptable and I've been focusing on brokering an honest, if difficult path forward to reform our police department. I've been adamant about advancing a both end approach to community safety and a department of public safety would be a very important way of formalizing that comprehensive approach. Now, as for the charter amendment that has been advanced by the vote yes campaign, uh, a couple things. It leaves an open, open ended as to the question as to whether we'll have uh, police in Minneapolis or as to whether Chief Arredondo or anyone else will be in that next role. And so I don't agree with that approach. I don't agree with approach where the head of public safety or the chief of police would be required to report to 14 bosses. Uh, so we need to be precise in how we approach these discussions. And, and I'm, uh, am I for the charter amendment? No, uh, it's not good governments. Am I for some of these underlying goals? Yes, enthusiastically I am. And no, I, I, I don't support that notion of diffusing the power structure so that when everyone is in charge, nobody is in charge. Uh, and as to our comprehensive plan, a comprehensive plan that we have laid out in depth, we've been clear, We've provided in concrete terms our community safety and accountability plan, which is grounded in the reality of governing. And it was released before any other candidate throughout for Minneapolis. Thank you for your answer. Uh, next, we're gonna go to Kate Knuth. Thank you. This is the question of this election and the question of this campaign because everyone in our community deserves to feel and be safe. And that is why I have worked with community and um, policy experts in multiple different areas to put forward a building community safety and transforming policing plan with multiple facets. And there's five key pillars that I want people to remember. First, we need to make economic security the foundation of public safety in our city. And we should be investing the $133 million our city is getting from the federal government with the American Recovery Plan in the basic economic security of people in our city, especially focused in black, brown, and indigenous communities. Second, we need a holistic, whole systems approach. What that means is we are putting violence prevention on par with what we are asking police to do. We need to invest more specifically in the Office of Violence Prevention. Third, we need to invest in young people as an essential part of violence prevention and intervention, especially invest in young men. And I support expanding the pilot work the Office of Violence Prevention is doing across the city to be investing in young people across the city to prevent cycles of violence. Third, we need to unbundle and transform the MPD. That's a little jargony. Unbundle means we are asking MPD to do too much and we need to be making sure that we have more effective responses when people are calling the city. They, of course, get a crisis response that does not always and should not always come from MPD. Finally, as mayor, I will be an active leader in this space. I will draw from learnings in cities across, this, across the country, across the state. We are not the only ones dealing with this and we can learn from other, other cities and places that are taking on these similar challenges. So 
I do support the charter amendment. I think we need to hit a reset to really dig in and build this holistic public safety approach that is focused on keeping every person in our city safe. And I am a candidate who can bring together the diverse groups of people who support abolish, who support more police and say, what do we actually do together to make okay. sure this works? The commitment to deep change and the experience working with people with many different backgrounds and experiences and across levels of government to actually make it happen. Thank you, Kate. Um, next is Sheila Najad. All right, thanks y'all. Um, hot topic. Heidi, I love that you started with history. Thank you so much. So not only am I a history nerd, I also helped start a group called MPD 150 that studied the Minneapolis Police Department's history and the reforms we've tried over the years, the reforms that have failed and the history of community creativity and resilience. So that's why I think it's so important um, to come in from that grounding and I do support the Charter Amendment. I actually helped draft the language that went through. So I understand it in and out. And we're in a coalition of, I think over 20 organizations from labor organizations to um, culturally specific organizations from small to large who all say, we need something different right now. And let's be clear, we're talking about this Charter Amendment because the MPD, in its current structure under the control of the mayor murdered George Floyd and then thousands of people took to the streets and were brutalized by the MPD and now we're under state and federal investigation. That's why we're talking about changing the charter. And for those who don't know what the charter is, it's basically our city's constitution. And so it says, this is the bare minimum of what we need in the city to take care of our residents. And right now it has a police department in there with a minimum number of police and that ratio was put in by the Federation, um, most recently headed by Bob Kroll. So what this amendment does is say, okay, let's change that. And instead of just the police, it's a department of public safety. And that department will combine all the public safety functions of the city. So there will still be 311 and 911. And there will be places where we get to grow and create new responses that are safe for everyone, right? And this is way more than two minutes worth of work. So again, please reach out to me. I would love to connect more and talk about this amendment. Thank you. You sensed I was about to cut you off, I guess. Um, let's see, it looks like um, we still don't have Diana. Um, Diana Sianeka is a survivor of gun violence and she's been working really closely with Brady's team enough to open a chapter here in Minnesota. So I would encourage folks to um, check that out and definitely go to Brady's website and get connected with Brady and team enough. Um, and I will go ahead and just ask um, Diana's question for her since we don't have her here. Her question is, the city currently provides services and programming for gun violence survivors at high risk of retaliatory gun violence. How will you expand the Office of Violence Prevention to provide direct services to all victims and survivors of gun violence? And um, let's see, it looks like we'd be starting with AJ. Thank you very much for the question. Um, as you guys probably heard throughout this forum so far, there's a theme that I really lean on in terms of my leadership here in the city and what I plan on doing. And when it comes to this specific issue, again, it has to be neighborhood centric. Uh, but we need to be a little bit more specific as what the mayor's asking for. Uh, I think what we need is a credible messenger. I'll give you an example. Uh, currently, OVP has this thing called calling. They're calling in uh, and they do it for group violence intervention, so GVI. And when they do that, these individuals that are high risk to retaliate and use gun violence or possibly be someone that uh, might uh, be a victim to gun violence, uh, sit down with law enforcement and they sit down possibly with the mayor. Uh, when we're talking about an office of violent prevention, which is really rooted in credibility, being able to have the community relationships, being able to inspire the youth to get away from gun violence. Uh, I think you need to have a credible mayor leading that. 
uh, as I speak for myself sitting here today, uh, I was a former gang member. Many people do not know that by the way I speak. Many people don't understand that with my JD, but I transformed my life and understood that if I'm going to do better, I'm going to have to build better habits. And for most black, brown, immigrant communities, what they're really looking for is an inspiration. And they want the OVP to be directed with someone that can give proper guidance. The word lived experience really resonates with me. And when Perry says it, it really is the best way to go about it in this city, in this year. And if we're going to expand what OVP does, uh, we're going to have to have a credible person willing to do that. And for me, going into office is looking at these neighborhood centers. How can we have a sub office of uh, violence prevention in these neighborhoods? How can we credibly partner up with these neighborhood associations, again, that are doing great work, but are being forced to centralize and take things top down? Um, and I think that's the only way forward if we're really going to inspire the youth. As you can see, I'm a young adult myself, and I don't understand and I don't think that many of these kids are struggling with gun violence. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap don't up, AJ. have the capacity. It's because they just don't have a way out. Thank you so much. Um, next is Mayor Jacob Fry. The true credibility and full credibility will not come from any single mayoral candidate, regardless of who they are. True credibility comes from community. It comes from those built-in relationships, which by the way, we make sure are present at these group violence intervention call-ins because they in fact are the true and trusted partners. And true public safety for all victims and survivors is not achieved when an approach is limited exclusively to law enforcement. We have a system problem, we all agree. Yes, we need to hold accountable those who commit violent crimes. And we have to acknowledge that trauma begets trauma, that sometimes the people who are engaged in gun violence were victims once before themselves. In other words, hurt people hurt people. And those who have been hurt need the proper care, they need support, and they must know that there will be a community and a local government that will be there for them in some of those hardest moments. We have taken those initiatives. Not all of them have made the press. True leadership is not just about what you say on Twitter. It's what you do a lot of times when nobody's looking. Uh, we've made and built out these relationships. I've hired people into my office that have been involved in that group violence intervention initiative. And that Office of Violence Prevention and Director Sasha Cotton have my enduring and unequivocal support. She and her team have put an extraordinary amount of work in that is simply indispensable to our communities. And I've been so lucky enough to learn from her over these last several years. And our proposal for the first wave of rescue plan funding also included half a million dollars for community trust and trauma response protocols that will bring the type of support that communities most impacted need. I haven't heard any critiques about the, uh, the monies that we've put out thus far for that initial influx. And we need to know that, that the trauma brought by violence has a, a physical impact. And our response to violence has to take that reality into account as well. That's the work that we're doing. It's hard, but we've been diligent. It's ongoing and you do it every single day. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, we'll go to Kate next. And I just wanna remind folks that um, the question is about ex potentially expanding the Office of Violence Prevention to provide direct services to all victims and survivors of gun violence. Kate? Well, thank you for the question and for the reminder of, of, of what it is. And I think it's important to ground um, response to survivors of gun violence in the lived experience of the, peop of the people of Minneapolis. I'm thinking particularly of families of Anaya and Ladavion and Trinity in North Minneapolis who are still struggling with um, the real and very present impact of gun violence in our city. And it's really important to recognize that 85% of gun violence victims in our city are, are our Black neighbors. And we need to make sure that we are responding to the people impacted by gun violence most directly with services that meet their needs. Um, I do ex ex support expanding the Office of Violence Prevention. My public safety plan increases would increase the uh, funding for the Office of Violence Prevention to $20 million a year. That's more than double uh, what the office is getting funded at currently. 
And as part of um, division of domestic gender and sexual violence response and prevention, there are a number of victim response services and supports that I think need to be included in that work. I talked about them earlier when we were talking about specifically domestic violence. Um, I want to make sure that our city um, is, is preventing, of course, the violence, but investing investing in ways that people do not just see them as selves as victims, but like in Survivors Lead are survivors of gun violence and are able to be fully embedded in our community in ways that, um, that help them move forward and help break the cycles of violence in our city. So yes, I fully support increasing significant investment of the Office of Violence Prevention, putting it on a similar level as the police department and making sure we are more fully investing in survivor uh, supports that make sure every survivor in the city has the resources they need to navigate what can be a really difficult system at one of the most difficult times in their lives. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, next up is Sheila and then Jarrell. Thank you. I definitely do support expanding support and funding and the work of the Office of Violence Prevention. And I was actually a leader in the coalition that helped create the office. So if we go back to 2018, it was a budget cycle and, and my specialty is in the city budget. And there had been these pilot projects the previous year for community-based safety strategies, creative money for community members to use to build safety in their communities. And Mayor Fry had proposed a new budget that didn't renew funding for those. And so we ran a campaign that said, um, instead of $1 million for eight new officers that we moved that $1 million in to create the Office of Violence Prevention. And it was because of so many of you who are watching, so many of you who are here and with us um, that we won that campaign. We went and testified at City Hall and created the Office of Violence Prevention. And it didn't start, stop there. In 2019, I was back at it with even more community members fighting for violence prevention funding because we knew that it worked. Communities have the answers and they just need the financial support, right? We need real financial support. That year, the council members struck a deal with the mayor to keep more money in policing and there was only a half million moved into violence prevention. But this past July and this past fall, even more, hundreds and hundreds of people, we were testifying, waiting on for hours on the phone because we believe in the solutions of violence prevention, of the work of the Office of Violence Prevention and so many other projects. And what we need is it to be funded to scale because yes, half million dollar for trauma and healing support is great, but we're still spending $3.1 million on the canine unit, right? So what are we saying is more important, right? So as mayor, I will fight to expand the services of the Office of Violence Prevention and really follow the lead of community members in developing creative solutions to keep one another safe. Thank you, Sheila. And um, it's to you, Jarrell. All right. So I agree with Mr. AJ. Um, we don't want to focus just on the end result, which leaves us with victims and survivors. Um, although I appreciate Ms. Diana's question. So let's use the Office of Violence Prevention more to prevent these, like Mayor Fry is currently doing with the uh, violence interrupters like Mr. Jamel Jackson with CEO Change Equals Opportunity. He's got the young people out there, they're on the streets of Minneapolis six days a week from five to 11, uh, actually making change. We have mentors like Mr. Sard with the Minnesota Freedom Fighters that are actually out there visibly providing that so that young people can see that there's actually real genuine people in their community that sincerely care about what is going on with them. Um, let's prevent it. And victims and survivors, they're not just looking for the justice and the end result. There's things like funeral expenses, unexpected funeral expenses, loss of income when a loved one is lost. There needs to be justice on all levels, whether that's care after the fact or even justice catching the person that did it. And one of the main things that I'm hearing from residents in Minneapolis is they don't just want justice when it's a member of the community providing the violence against their loved one. 
They also want justice when it's violence perpetrated by an officer that is unnecessary. Um, like somebody just made mention of Princess Anaya, Prince, uh, Princess Trinity, Mr. Ladavion, uh, Miss Samantha got unnecessarily shot and lost her life up at the liquor store. That has been a beacon of complaints in our community forever and ever and ever. And for some reason, the mayor, our city leadership have not moved to take action in regards to stuff like that. Again, there are a lot of things we can do, but taking care of victims and survivors is the biggest thing we can do. And they need to tell us exactly how we can do that so that we can get to it. Thank you so much for that answer and for all of your answers. Um, our next question will be asked by Rita Ortega. Rita is the child of a native mother and a Cuban immigrant father and the proud mother of two Lakota daughters. She is a born and raised Southsider and a long time Little Earth of United Tribes resident. Rita is an organizer who has spent the last decade fighting for her communities at City Hall and in the streets. Welcome Rita. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here and ask you this question. This question is really personal to me. Um, I have experienced some violence um, by a police officer myself and have, I'm a survivor of gun violence as well. So it's, it's hard to, to live with all these different traumas and I can know um, what it feels like. But um, here's my question. Minneapolis police officers were found to have used catamine to subdue dozens of suspects, many of whom were already restrained. Then came murders of Justine Damon, George Floyd, the law East, Dante Ray, and Winston Smith. MPD has a long history of harming the community. How do we move forward in this moment? And how do we hold them accountable? Thank you so much for asking that, Rita. And our answers are going to start with Mayor Jacob Fry. I apologize. I missed the, it cut out for just a second there on the question. So I, I'm asking since MPD has a long history of harming. The community how do we move forward and how do we keep accountability thank you uh rita I, I greatly appreciate it the the only way to chart a path forward towards progress is through a very honest examination of our past uh, and this year's long relationship uh, between the mpd and and, and We've seen a number of different issues throughout uh, the last several years. I mean, we saw the murder of, of Justine Damon it was tragic. The murder of George Floyd and so many others has forever altered our city's history and has gave, given way to a centuries in the making reckoning around racial justice. And the truth is there are no shortcuts. There is no magic wand to wave or, or hashtag to slap online. This is going to require hard work and diligence because these problems are the product of systems built and codified in state and federal law and union contracts that, that benefit from those laws. So where do we go from here? I've outlined an honest path forward that includes working with Director Sasha Cotton, that includes safety beyond policing, that includes working with Chief Arredondo and bringing community into the fold in a way that honors the complexity of these challenges. Public safety requires public trust and public trust requires transparency. And that's why we've brought body camera compliance in the MPD from 55% when we took office to 95% in most recent reports. That's why we've overhauled the use of force policy to make it as stringent as possible under state law. That's why we've overhauled how the investigative process works around disciplinary actions with officers to make sure that in the long run, we are truly getting justice. Uh, a life lost at the hands of, of the state is, is one life too many. Um, we can't simply wait around for the next officer involved killing. The fact that so many jurisdictions have been involved with these killings around Minnesota, around the country, speaks to the urgency of getting reforms done, not just here in Minneapolis, but at the state and federal level as well. Um, we need to recognize the magnitude of this moment. We need to make sure that the precision 
of our solutions match the precision of the harm that has been inflicted time and time again. Uh, and that is exactly the direction that we need to move. Thank you so much, Mayor Fry. Um, next up is Kate Knuth. Well, thank you for this question, Rita, and it's really good to see you here and be part of this conversation. Um, we need to start by being very clear that MPD has caused harm to people in our community for years, and that harm has been particularly focused in our Black, Brown, and Indigenous neighbors. And there's very good reasons people don't trust our MPD and don't trust the way um, we're responding to violence and crime in the city and, and the way we're trying to keep people safe now. What we are doing isn't working. And I unfortunately have um, the experience of police violence in my family. Uh, I lost a, a cousin at the hands of law enforcement and I know what it feels like to have government um, close ranks and to protect its own. And we have seen that too often in the city of Minneapolis. The news that came out about George Floyd initially was unacceptable because it wasn't true. We are still struggling as a city to get information about what happened to Winston Smith. I know he was not killed by MPD, but there are so many in our community who want answers about what really happened. That transparency and that accountability starts from the moment something happens. And of course, we want to make sure that moment never happens, but if it does, it needs to start from the moment it happens. And we have not seen that in this city and we need to make sure we see that. And as mayor, I will make sure that happens going forward, that the system does not protect itself when it has caused huge harm to people in our city. And to move forward, we can't just respond to what has happened. We need to build the new and we need to build together. And that is why I support the charter change. That is why I support a more holistic, um, comprehensive approach to public safety. People are demanding real change. And the only way we move forward is to be honest about what has happened, the harm that has been caused, be honest about what happens as it, as it plays out and make sure that we are building a system together that results in no person being killed by MT, MPD at the most basic level, but no person having an interaction with MPD where it harms their dignity and harms them in ways um, that they carry uh, in our community throughout their lives. That's the vision I have of public safety and MPD in our, in our city. And as mayor, I'm really um, wanting to dig in on that work with, with folks and communities across our city. Thank you, Kate. Next is Sheila Najad. Thank you. Thank you, Rita, for that question. This is heavy, y'all. I'm going to invite everyone watching and everyone here to just take a collective breath right now. Let's just do it. Yeah. So we've been in this cycle of trauma response, it's not just for the last year, but for those of us who are from indigenous communities, communities of color, immigrant communities, since America's existence, right? The United States existence, I should say. So my background is in public safety. As I said, I've studied the history of the MPD and I've been an organizer on public safety for years. And the system makes you feel crazy, right? It's violence upon violence and then promise upon promise of change. And yet at the end of the day, for those of us who are on the streets, we're not seeing the change, right? And the next thing you know, you're at yet another protest of yet another person killed by MPD. So it's really difficult to believe what's told. So when we talk about healing from trauma, I don't want an elected official to tell me how I should heal from my trauma. I don't want a detailed plan on how I'm gonna heal from my trauma. I want an elected official who opens up breathing space because what happened to me is different than what happened to my neighbor, is different than what happened to you, but we all deserve to heal and be free from violence. And to get there, that's why we need to change the whole system. That's why we need housing. That's why we need more childcare youth programming. So we have that time to breathe and heal. And yes, we have to absolutely change the way we keep one another safe because we have 150 years of experience 
that shows us that the way we're doing it is not right. And I'll just finish by saying, one of the things I'd like to do as mayor is a census style community outreach program to hear from every single neighbor, what makes you feel safe? What would a new safety system look like to you? And then we're gonna build it together. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, next we'll hear from Jarrell and then AJ. So Ms. Rita, I'm very sorry to hear what you've had to go through and I, sincerely thank you for having the courage to come on and then even thank you for your question. Um, like I said earlier, it's one thing to understand what somebody's telling you and it's a whole nother thing to have that ex as firsthand experience. And I have that so I totally empathize with you as a black man, as people in Minneapolis, but especially as a black man, I'm scared to go outside of the house, not knowing what's going to happen if there's going to be a stray bullet flying or if the police are going to decide that today's the day that they're going to yank my chain, you know, and it's, it's, it's terrorizing period. And what we're going to do, people are asking for community control of the police. That's not too much to ask because apparently the mayor cannot handle it. The council cannot handle it. They cannot agree. So the community knows what's best for the community. And we can do that through the people's police conduct commission a resident led commission where they can take complaints, they can ass assess them, they can use the body cameras and everything. And Mayor Fry is talking about a over 90% compliance rate with the body cameras. That is totally unacceptable. There's 100% of body cams attached, so there should be 100% compliance. And for the officers that do not, want, do not want to comply with that, they need to find a different job in a different city. Um, the Office of Violence Prevention, we also need to utilize them more. I'm not saying to arm them, but we should at least protect their lives while they're willing to risk their lives. They should at least have some of the best that the officers have left behind. Um, Mayor Fry said to fix the Minneapolis Police Department, we have to work with the Minneapolis Police Department. That's not true. How many of you watch and get to walk into your job and tell your supervisor how you're gonna do that job that day? Who and what you're gonna be accountable for? The mayor is the boss. The mayor can decide and announce right here on this forum that we will abolish deadly force unless it is against deadly force. That's the only way that we should be justifying taking somebody's life, regardless of what they did. <laughs> Capital punishment is gone in Minnesota. So even to call somebody a murderer does not justify us taking their life. And I, I'm not speaking on anybody's personal situation. I'm just saying punishment is gone. We have to do what we have to do for the people of Minneapolis and move forward. They want community control of, of the police. We need to go ahead and do that. It we're a bit we're a bit over time, so I'm sorry to cut you off, but let's go to AJ and hear his answer for this question. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Now, I can tell you that I'm in Ford of an initiative that's going to separate guns. Uh, off the streets for initiatives like traffic stops. I can tell you that we need to invest more in MPD and separate the duties that MPD does. Uh, I can tell you uh, a lot of specific things that I think the trajectory for many of the other candidates is to, is to go on. Um, I don't think that's the issue. I don't think the issue is the end product here, to be honest. And I do not believe that collectively all of the suggestions that we might have as specific candidates uh, is gonna make an impact if the process isn't proper. And that's why I firmly believe that if there's not trust built in, I mean, all the scholarly work in criminology, uh, all the historical records in this country shows that when there's moments like this in society, trust is what we need to rebuild. So why are we not focusing on the process to this new department of public safety? Why are we not focusing on this process for how and what the MPD is going to do? That is the error I see from every single other candidate. And I cannot say in good conscience that this is going to be a benefit for black and brown communities. This is getting hijacked and I don't understand why we're not having an honest conversation. Let's go back to step number one, which is, what do we do to bring trust in all the communities to believe in the next steps moving forward? And I believe that the way we do that is to have the city 
through the leadership of the city in conjunction with the people through a citizen's assembly, making a formal recommendation, being part of that process, bringing in experts, whether it's in the state level, a national level, heck, international level. I think we can do that as a city. We do not have to rush a moment that means a lot to black and brown communities. If we are just going to waste it with just suggestions that everybody thinks is going to work, then you forgot that trust you overstepped. So please, if you really wanna have change in the city, let's go back to that trust building. And I think I'm the credible candidate that can do that for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our last question tonight was the most asked question we received. We received this question more than any other from Minneapolis residents. Our city would most like to know, what would your plans be for the sacred memorial space known as George Floyd Square at 38th in Chicago? And we are going to start with Kate Knuth. Well, thank you for the question, um, because I think the murder of George Floyd in George Floyd Square is asking us to stop and to do things differently. We can't keep doing business as usual in this city um, and expect different outcomes. Too many people have been harmed and too many people will be harmed going forward if we don't dig in this moment and use it to create the real change we need to see happen. So the morning that um, the mayor sent in city staff to clear uh, or begin reconnection, I think phase reconnection is the, the phrase that was used. Um, at 4.30 in the morning, I went down to George Floyd Square um, to listen, to hear how people were reacting, to understand what this moment meant to people. Um, and what I heard uh, was that sending people in at 4.30 in the morning to put the power of the city government um, into the decision-making in that real and serious way, um, further traumatized people and undermined the already very, very little trust that is um, between the community and the city government and moving forward at 38th in Chicago. So we could say open, don't open. It should look designed like this. It should look designed like that. I don't think that is the root of the question. As mayor, I, need, I will dig in and meet what the murder of George Floyd has asked us to do and what the people holding space at the intersection of 38th and Chicago, George Floyd Square has asked us to do. And that is to actually make this a turning point towards racial justice. And we need to both talk about the physical space and we need to talk about the 24 demands of community. And not saying we will meet all of those demands, but working together and say, how do we actually meet these? How do we make it happen? What other levels of government do we need to bring in to make the real progress we need? It is not only a city issue, there are demands with county, there are demands with state, there are demands with different kinds of funding, but really digging in on what people are asking for. Now, in one of the other things I really heard um, down at George Floyd Square was that people don't want us to forget. We cannot forget what happened to George Floyd and we cannot forget how our city reacted. So I think we need to be moving forward you, um, on real ways like a national historic site um, that I would be a big advocate for that at George Floyd Square um, to make sure that we as a city never forget what happened here and make the change necessary demanded by this moment. Thank you. Next, let's go to Sheila Najat. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who ask this question and everyone who's been holding space over the last year. I live not too far from George Floyd Square, um, had the uh, distinct trauma inducing of having constant helicopters over my house for the last year. Um, so I hear it, I feel it, I've been there. Um, so here's the thing is that you can't bypass justice to get to unity. You can't bulldoze your way to peace, right? Our community is hurting and people closed down George Floyd Square because they didn't trust elected officials to make change that would result in true justice for George Floyd. And unfortunately, they've been right so far, right? So there are a lot of things that should have been done a year ago 
But in this moment, with this next mayor, we need someone who's ready to fight for the people, and put the people first. And as a community organizer, I know that in social justice work, there are no cut and dry answers, right? But we have to work together to get there. That's why I wanna do this door-to-door -door canvassing program. The city did send out surveys about the future of the square that only had a couple options. Um, but the folks I talked with said this was not community engagement. In a time, in a pandemic, when we need public jobs, when we need to make sure everyone gets a chance to have their voice heard, we could knock every door in the Bryant neighborhood around George Floyd Square and listen to what the community wants in a true way, in an engaged way, in a way that can't be spun with statistics, right? And then we put resources behind that plan. And at the end of the day, this is about reparations, right? So as mayor, I would support a reparations plan for Minneapolis that includes reparations for black community members harmed by police and black people impacted by America's legacy of economic and social violence. We have great examples of how to put it in practice from cities like Chicago. And it's time for Minneapolis to step up and get moving on this. So I'm excited Thank to- Thank you. Yeah, thanks Rachel. Thank you, Sheila. Um, next we'll hear from Jarrell Perry. All right, thank you for the question. Um, we already have more than enough things that are dividing the community, um, especially in regards to the violence. Um, and instead of further dividing the community by pitting black residents and black groups against each other, um, that's totally disgusting to me. Instead of paying almost a half a million dollars to have a group go against the same people that they spent over a year protecting, that is disgusting and it's underhanded and it's dirty. Um, as far as the community, there are so many things that can be done uh, like was just mentioned, the justice resolution. We keep saying we don't know what to do for these people. We don't know what they want. We don't know how to open the intersection. The justice resolution was given to the mayor very recently after George Floyd was murdered. It calls for things like investment in the community, facade grants for the local businesses that are over there, um, mental health services, wellness services, jobs for the youth, all these different things that we're saying we want and yet we're investing in tearing communities apart when that same money could have been used to start adopting the justice resolution. We plan, propose, adopt, and recommend all these other things. Why have we not mentioned the justice resolution, which is the one thing that the community collectively has said that they wanted? I totally don't understand that, but change is coming. When a Perry administration enters the office in January, we will immediately start implementing an art district in George Floyd Square to memorialize the, the, there's just so much that's going on over there. And then even businesses, reparations, that's a good word, but reconciliation is even better one. We're gonna put back what was already there. We're not giving nobody anything. We're not giving handouts. We are replacing what has been broken, what has been torn apart. We will make a new business every month for the entire four year administration to make sure that that community is what it desperately deserves. They have been through so much. There's Thank you, Gerald. Asking for tax breaks for the residents that have been inconvenienced, grants for those businesses. This is a matter of life and death for so many people and it's something that we have to spend the time on. Sorry about that, Rachel. No problem. We're gonna go to AJ and then uh, finish with a Mayor Jacob Fry. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, when it comes to this very issue, um, I'm of the belief that the community should lead. So I agree with many of the candidates that have that approach. Uh, ultimately, I don't think that any mayor should dictate to the community in 38th in Chicago, what are the steps forward? Uh, but in addition to that, I also think that it is a no brainer that we should memorialize that area. And Kate's suggestion of making it a historical site and putting it on the national registry is a phenomenal one, which I would also honestly back. Um, but what I really think about this issue is how big do we really wanna make this? The way that I see it is we need to make sure that we take steps that crystallize in the history of the city that stuff like this is unacceptable. And we do it in a way that educates and makes sure 
next and, and future generations can actually learn from this mistake. Uh, I think we have gotten away as Americans on how to reflect and put things in a positive light. So in that spirit, I would first and foremost discuss with those community members to really lead on this issue. And I know the mayor's probably gonna say that you have to take a position and that's what you're going to do, but really it's not. I think that we can get the community to compromise. I think we can get the community to go ahead and facilitate what they think is in their interest and what they would like the city to do for them. Um, and if it's something that's big, then big it is because I think people need to remember that this was a big issue. Um, that being said, you know, we need to really reflect a little bit also on this issue of leadership, because I think there's a misunderstanding, at least from what I'm hearing from the mayor. And leadership to me means that you give people your lived experience and your guidance to tough issues, and you really direct the city departments. I am standing in side by side with the mayor, and I think, you know, honesty and, and, and giving somebody credit when they're right on an issue is very important. So the Charter Amendment for Change, to really give the mayor more power is the right step forward, right? Because we can't have a 14 boss problem. And the reason why I believe Thank that is because you, then you. the mayor's gonna be able to actually lead these departments and give them guidance. And I think my lived experience, my professional experience would allow us to really carve a new path forward and transform. AJ, I apologize, I'm gonna have to cut you right. off because of time, but I do want to go to Mayor Jacob Fry, and everyone will have an opportunity at the end to, to give their pitch, okay? So Mayor Fry, you're next. So we've been guided at George Floyd Square uh, by a couple of non-negotiable goals. First, that space should forever be memorialized as a space for racial justice and healing and a place to honor George Floyd and his family that the residents and the workers who have invested in a historic black neighborhood have access to basic and essential government services, hours of engagement with every stakeholder, direct meetings, behind the scenes work with community leaders that you don't see, organizers to forge progress and meet these racial equity goals, not just through the demands, but well beyond. That work has taken place, that work is underway. From others, I've heard a number of comments. I've heard, well, you gotta dig in, we are. I've heard you have to listen to people. We are, we have. I've heard that we gotta work together with community around these 24 demands and that is happening. Check out what we just proposed as part of the American Rescue Act. Facade grants that can be allocated to that area. Mental health services specifically focused for our black and indigenous community, jobs for youth, grants for businesses that have suffered over this last year. As far as a historic registry is goes, we're also looking at that. But here's the thing, as mayor, you also gotta actually figure out how to make it work. The job is far more than talking points or a hashtag. You actually have to figure out how to dig in to work with a broad spectrum of community that by the way, oftentimes doesn't agree. And then you gotta chart a clear path forward. We've been doing that work. George Floyd Square is one of the most complex and difficult situations out there, but we've been working alongside Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins. We've been working with Council Member Cano. We've been working with a broad and diverse set of interests and, and, a, and a broad spectrum of opinions. Is it tough? Absolutely it is. But you need to provide a little bit more than just dig in and listen to everyone and bring people together to actually chart a clear path forward as mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Um, finally tonight, we would like to give each of the candidates an opportunity to address everyone watching who's concerned about public safety in Minneapolis. I'm sorry, we didn't get to all of your questions. There were so many great ones submitted. Um, each candidate has a minute to speak to the community and we'll begin with Sheila Najad. Thank you. Well, thank you all who are watching out there. We really appreciate you and would love to connect in the future. My vision is a Minneapolis where safety means safety for everyone and everyone has someone to call when they need help. I am rooted in communities and what makes me different is that my experience comes from building in movements led by Black, Indigenous, POC, 
queer, trans, and working class people. My knowledge comes from working alongside the people of Minneapolis as a restaurant worker, organizer, and health researcher. The safety and policy ideas I support for the city were developed alongside hundreds of others who share my Minneapolis for a that share my vision for Minneapolis where everyone can thrive and not just survive. I would love to connect with you to build together because we're not going to change a 150 year old institution overnight. And if we want to create an institution that has more justice, we need to do it together. So SheilaForThePeople.com, I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Next is Gerald Perry. All right, thank you, Rachel. I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, again, our current mayor has said that he's tried to fix this problem with public safety over the last three years, and uh, we don't have another three years to wait. And like I said earlier, the people of Minneapolis will not wait. It's time to move forward. Uh, to the people of Minneapolis, I'm asking for you to allow me the privilege to stand with you and your family. Allow me to fight for you, advocate for you. Minneapolis has ranked choice voting, meaning you get to pick up to three candidates. Uh, first, second, or third choice. Of course, I would appreciate your first, but any of them consideration would be greatly appreciated. We have a lot of work in front of us, again, whether it's racial reconciliation, education reconciliation, housing reconciliation, job reconciliation. There is so much ahead of us to, to accomplish, and it's going to take all of us coming together to get it done. So I invite anybody to come and visit perryforthepeople.com. If you're willing to give an hour or two of your time in a week or donate financially, Anything that you're willing to do, again, it would be more than appreciated. And again, thank you, everybody, for your time. And thank you, Rachel, for moderating. Thank you, Jarrell. Uh, next, we'll go to AJ Awed. Thank you very much. Um, I promised myself one fundamental thing through this campaign trail, and that was I was not going to lie to myself, and I was going to be honest at all times. Um, when we're talking about what we're going to be doing moving forward, we're really going to have to think about who that person is. And to me, at the end of the day, Jacob Fry cannot get a second chance. I want every other colleagues of mine that are running in this election to understand that as progressives and as people that I think have a lot of overlap, that should be the commitment. And I don't want to call him out, and it's not a vendetta. It's just that he really failed the city. And for me, that failure should not be rewarded. Uh, I think we need to come together. And that is the message that I've had throughout this campaign and believe is the only way forward as a city. I think I have the lived experiences and I have the requirements and background to actually lead this city. And unlike what Jacob is saying, when you roll up your sleeve and you get your hands dirty, that will be the time for it. But what we're selling the city and what I want the takeaway to be for everyone watching is the city is not gonna heal with someone that's not credible to bring people together. And if Thank we're looking you, for AJ. credibility, AJ Awet is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from our current mayor, Jacob Fry. Thank you to the Brady Campaign, Survivors Lead, the Community Justice Action Fund, and, and March for Our Lives, and everyone who's tuned in, and, and also the fellow candidates for mayor that are presently running. Uh, these conversations, they require a clarity and purpose. They require honesty and approach. They require integrity and they require honesty in discussing our history, where we've been as well as a clear path forward. Minneapolis needs to be the place where change started anew. We need to be the local government that advances a progressive vision that is attainable. These goals require debate and rigor but they also require elected officials who will tell you the truth about the work ahead. We've issued a bevy of reforms to create a more just department. We've taken our investments in policing to new heights. We've invested heavily in Office of Violence Prevention specifically to move beyond the traditional components of law enforcement. And we've also made sure that we've laid out plans that both recognize the urgent and the long-term goals that Chief Arredondo has pressed to see come to fruition while pursuing new safety solutions and police reform. Our core convictions aren't unchanged, uh, but they've been deepened over the last year. We can do better and that work has happened. We can reshape the MPD through reforms, through getting new community-oriented officers into the department, 
And we don't need to do so at the expense of, of the strong prevention and intervention work that we're supporting. Safety is a harmony between the neighborhoods. Uh, we wanna see that throughout Minneapolis and through a both end approach and we can make that happen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, next, we'll hear from Kate Knuth. Well, thank you all for organizing this opportunity for us to really dig in on the key issue of this campaign. Um, and that is making sure everyone in our city, regardless of race, gender, zip code, income, age, level of ability, feels safe and is safe in our city. And that's what I'm hearing when I'm out talking with people from all different backgrounds, with all different perspectives. They want us to move forward on real significant transformative change. Even more, they want mayoral leadership who can help us navigate crisis and actually build those changes through and with our city government. I bring both that commitment to significant transformative change and a real plan to make it happen in terms of public safety. And I bring the experience and leadership of having worked in multiple levels of government, of having built programs from the bottom up from an idea into an actual program at the University of Minnesota and a huge public bureaucracy. And I have dug in and governed and made real substantive policy progress and built trust with multiple different partners and perspectives to actually deliver on the change we need to happen in the city. So I'm asking for your support as mayor, but even more, I am asking for you to lean into this work, to dig deep, to find the courage, to actually build a city we know is possible, to build a city where everyone is safe and everyone has a home. And we are taking on the big challenges of our time, like climate change with the sense of urgency necessary. I believe we in the city of Minneapolis can build a true multiracial democracy 